All right, Genesis 37, you have your place. We're going to start in verse 18, verse 18, and just read down a couple verses of Genesis 37. Let's stand, shall we, as we get started again today. And they, and verse 18, and when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. Now Joseph had been looking for his brothers, of course. Joseph had a dream, which he said he was uh, uh, he interpreted, and that they would bow down to him. They would bow to him. And so they, Joseph goes to find his brethren at Dothan, and when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him, and cast him into some pit, and we will say some evil beast hath devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. And Reuben heard it. And he delivered him out of their hands and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said unto them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him, that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. Now let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity. And Lord, we thank you again for the privilege of opening your word. We thank you for your word, Lord, that you've given us. And, Lord, that you have provided for us, Lord, that we might study it, might read it, might know it, might understand it. Lord, I pray again today that you'll meet with us in these few moments. Uh, Lord, help us, we pray. Uh, Lord, rightly divide the word of truth. And Lord, I pray that you would encourage us this morning. And, Lord, that we would be greatly encouraged today. And I pray for every saved person today, every born person. Lord, I, I thank you that you said you'd never leave us. Lord, I thank you for the song, You Must Be Born Again. For every born-again person in this room today, for every person who's been saved by the blood of the Lamb, Lord, I, I pray for them today that, Lord, they might find that true acceptance. They might find that with thee. Lord, we pray. It's a terrible thing to be rejected. Terrible. Lord, we thank you that we are not rejected in thee. Lord, bless us, we pray, and help us now in these few moments. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen, you may be seated. I, I suppose that probably most everybody in here at some time or other has been rejected uh, in some way or another. It may be just a minor thing in your life or it may have been a major thing that absolutely scarred you for life. That you have been rejected about something. And it could be something minor. I mean, it could be like, I remember the first ball team I ever went out for when I was in the ninth grade uh, coach just said to me, and, and they only had a varsity team, he said, well, you're in the ninth grade, and he said, you're not very old, and, and I wasn't very big then, and, and still not, but he said, you're not very big, he said, come back next year, and, and uh, that was kind of devastating. He eventually came to me, realized the error of his ways, and said, you may as well come on out for the team, we don't have anybody else, so, you know, it's like, so, uh, or, and, it, or it could be, you know, like, um, you, you remember your first boyfriend, or your first girlfriend, and when you broke up with him, you thought it was the end of the world, that the, the world would never be right again because uh, true love had passed you by and that you would never find Mr. Right or Mrs. Right, whoever it may be. Or it, it may have been something that of more serious, of a more serious nature that perhaps growing up, you sensed maybe your mom and dad really didn't care for you a whole lot. And, uh, and, and I don't mean in a, in a joking way, you know, my parents moved five times, but I found them every time, you know, not that kind of thing. But it's like um, you, you sense, and the parents sometimes say, you know, terrible, hard things to their kids. I wish you had never been born. Or they'll say things like, why can't you be like your brother? Uh, I am just like him. That's why I am the way I am. But, you know, why can't you? And they'll say hurtful things. And this, this sense of rejection or, or even worse, uh, you know, sometimes in life we go through tragic things, things like divorce. Uh, and just a sense of rejection in our life. Joseph is rejected by his brethren. They, they, it, the opposite, of course, of rejection is acceptance. They did not accept Joseph. He, as I said, had had a dream, had a vision in which they bowed down to him. Now, he was not the youngest of the brothers, but he was one of the youngest. Uh, Joseph, I mean, Benjamin, of course, being younger. And so the older brothers resented it very, very, very much that Joseph had had a dream in which the 12 brothers, he interpreted, would bow down to him. And that's why they said there in verse 19, and they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh, 
And then they said in verse 20, and we shall see what shall become of his dreams. They said they're going to kill him. They absolutely rejected Joseph and would not accept him. Of course, you remember the story, how the story ended. Eventually, Joseph becomes second in command, second in all of Egypt. And his brothers came down, and they did do obeisance. They did bow down to him. And, uh, but God meant it for, they meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. You think of the maniac of Gadara, Mark chapter 5, how he lived continually. He couldn't live with normal people. Now, there was a reason, of course. He was a maniac. He was demon-possessed. Uh, he constantly beat people up. They, they tried to bind him with chains and fetters. He constantly broke the chains, broke the fetters, ran around naked, cut himself with stones, beat people up, and lived in tombs by himself, totally rejected by man. Nobody wanted anything to do with him. Nobody would accept him. Mark chapter 1, we find the story of the leper that came to Jesus and beseeched him and said, he said, if thou can, he said, have mercy upon me. Jesus reached out and touched him. Now, you know the, the, the case with lepers. Lepers were considered highly contagious. And if you got leprosy, you were going to die. Um, it's like uh, somebody's doc says to you, I've got bad news, you've got stage four cancer. Now, unless an absolute miraculous thing happens to you, if you have stage four cancer, you're not going to make it. Basically, what well, they'll give you medicine and say, here, we'll try to make you comfortable, but you're probably with stage four cancer, unless God directly intervenes, you're not going to make it. If you had leprosy, you had stage four cancer. Now, you may not be going to die today. You may not be going to die next week. You may not be going to die next month. But eventually, your body would begin to fall apart, literally drip away, and you would die. When Jesus healed the lepers, and in the, in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus healed some lepers. They were a great way off. They cried a great way off. Jesus, of, of not, have mercy upon us. Why? Because they were unclean and could not come around people. Totally rejected by by civilized, if we can say that, civilized society. William Booth, who was the founder of the old time Salvation Army, has nothing to do with the Salvation Army today, nothing like it. William Booth went to the, I believe it was the Methodist, the Methodist, and said that he wanted a church. He wanted to be a preacher. He studied to be a preacher. He wanted to be a preacher. And they plain just flat out rejected him. And he came home, his wife came out the door to meet him, all excited, all excited and happy. He said, where'd they, where'd they give you a church? What are they going to do? And he just looked at her and said, uh, they, have, they have nothing for me. Rejection. G. Campbell Morgan was one of, is one of the most prolific religious writers of the 19th century, which would have been in the 1800s. I never quite figured that one out, but in the 1900s, he lived in the 18th, 1800s, but in the 19th century, whatever. He was one of the most prolific religious writers uh, and preachers of that era. He was in a group of 150 guys candidating for ministerial school. He was in a building that seated 1,000 people. When it got his time to get up to speak, because he had been accepted, but he had to have a sermon, he got up to speak. There were three people in a building of 1,000, three people who were grading him, and 75 curious people that had come to hear him. He lost everything, lost his train of thought, lost his idea about the message, lost everything. Two weeks later, he got a letter from the ministerial college, simply said, rejected, rejected. He wrote his father a one-word telegram, rejected. His father was sent a telegram back, said, rejected of men, but accepted of God. Accepted of God. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1 for a moment. Let me speak to you for a few minutes today on the idea of being accepted by God. In Ephesians chapter 1, we read this, uh, Paul writing. Ephesians chapter 1. It's a terrible thing to be rejected. It's a terrible thing not to be accepted. It's a terrible thing to have people not to want to have anything to do with you. It's a terrible thing when people don't want to talk to you and and not to want you around them. But it's a terrible thing to think that God does not accept me. 
that I am not accepted by God. Now, listen, I'm not talking to lost people today. I'm talking to saved people today. I'm talking to people today that have been born again, that you know Jesus is your Savior, that heaven is your home, your sins are forgiven, uh, that your name is written in that Lamb's Book of Life. I, I, that's who I'm talking to today. I'm not talking about somebody that is an out-and-out -out sinner that's lost and dying. I'm glad you're here. If you're here like that, we're glad that you're here. But I'm, I want to speak, I want to direct my thoughts today to you that are saved, to, to us who are saved, to me that is saved. Uh, that we are accepted by God, that you and I are accepted. Ephesians chapter 1, and then we'll start in verse 5. Having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of, his, of the glory of his grace. <clears throat> now, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Joseph was not accepted was totally rejected by his brethren. They were going to kill him, but Reuben convinced them all, throw him in the pit. Reuben's idea was later he would come back and get him out and send him back home to his father Jacob. Of course, Reuben left, came back. They had already sold him into slavery down into Egypt. You and I have been sold into slavery uh, because of Adam, by, wherefore by one man sin entered the world, thus death passed upon all men, now, we are all guilty. It's not, okay, Adam was the first sinner, but God, uh, uh, but, but Adam, <coughs> you have to forgive my voice, uh, uh, the sin of Adam passed down upon us. And we're all sinners. And we are alienated from the household of God. And we are not accepted. Just as Joseph was rejected and was not accepted by his brothers, you and I are, are, are rejected by God. Now there's one reason, one reason only, and it's because of that sin problem. That is a sin problem. Now, it says that we are accepted in the beloved. I'm going to say something about that in a minute. But let me give you a couple things this morning about being accepted by God. And some things that really, really hinder people, I believe save people, that really hinder them from time to time in their Christian life about this idea of acceptance. I know that it was true of me. I know it was true of me. Uh, I knew, I knew, I know, I knew that God loved me. I knew that. But I was not always, always aware of the fact that God totally accepted me uh, of the way I am. And we want to see that this morning. But let me give you a couple things. Number one is this, that God loves us. God loves us. God loves us. Now, there's a whole lot more to that verse or to that idea. God is love, that, that God loved us. There's a whole lot more to that than just what we say. John 3.16, most everybody knows John 3.16, for God so loved the world. Thank you, you do know. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God loves us. You say, well, how do you know that God loves us? He loves us because he proved it, Romans 5.8, but God commends his love to us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, if you read Romans chapter 5, I believe it's verse 6 and 7, for a good man, some would dare to die, peradventure for a righteous man, one would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners. Wasn't that we were good? Wasn't that we were righteous? It is that we were sinners. God loves us, and he loves us unconditionally. Now you say, well, what do you mean by unconditional preacher? Well, simply this. God loves you the way you are. Now, I, I got this from Adrian Rogers, and I know that it's true. God loves you just the way you are, but he loves you too much for you to stay the way you are. Now, but God loves you just the way you are. Now, he does want you to grow in grace. He does want you to learn to be obedient. God does want you to grow in knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. God wants you to do that. He wants you to become a mature Christian. But God loves you just the way that you are. Now, I know some people say, well, we'll use that as an excuse for, well, I'll just continue on the way that I am. I've had people tell me, you know, well, they've got a bad temper. Well, look, and they'll just say to you, well, that's just the way God made me. Number one, God did not make you that way, and that is no excuse for you staying that way. But, you know, people say, well, you know, this is the way I am, this is the way I am, this is the way I am. Well, let me just say this to you, that God loves you just the way that you are. It's an unconditional love. It's unconditional. Well, what do I got to do for God to love me more? Nothing. You, you, you can't do anything more. He said, well, what is it that I must, I must have to do something. I want God to love me more. 
How can you love somebody more than you already love them? See, we get our idea about love, and sometimes we get it from marriage when you say, well, to the other half, I love you. The problem with a lot of marriages, not, and I'm not saying yours, but a problem with a lot of marriages today is people's love is based, it's conditional love. I'll love you as long as you're good looking. I'll love you as you can cook, as long as you can cook. I'll love you as long as you provide for me. I'll love you as long as you don't get old and fat and bald and gray. I'll love you. See, that's conditional love. God's love is not like that. God's love for you and I never, ever, 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 ever changes. You say, well, what if I do something wrong? We'll get to that. What if I do something wrong? Well, we'll get to that. What if I do something wrong? And you're going to do something wrong. There is absolutely no way that you can keep from messing up. And I want you to know something. I'm going to say this again in a few minutes. I want you to know this morning that you are a total spiritual failure. That's what you are. Amen. You say, preacher, that I'm very kind. But that's what you are. That is what you are. But God loves you unconditionally. Even though I'm a total spiritual failure, absolutely. God still loves you that way. You know what? We say, well, if you don't mind, I'm taking my jacket off today. Because you love me unconditionally, amen? I'll be like that guy I saw somewhere. Maybe he just threw it across the audience and said his wife. But anyway, it's like, uh, um, you say, well, uh, preacher, God loves me unconditionally? Absolutely. Our problem, with, our problem in our homes today is, well, you know, if you do what I tell you to do, I love you. No, that's not unconditional love. Unconditional love. People are often in the idea of marriage, what can I get out of this marriage? You'll never have a happy marriage if that's your idea of marriage. What can I get out of this marriage? The idea of unconditional love is what can I do for the other person in my marriage? I expect nothing in return. I expect nothing in return. If you look at what God did for Israel in the Old Testament, God made four covenants with Israel. He made the Abrahamic covenant, which simply said you'll be a great people. He made the Palestinian covenant, which said you'll have a lot of land. He made the Davidic covenant, which said there will be a king ruling from Jerusalem forever and ever. And he made the new covenant, which said they'll have a new heart. And if you read those four covenants, one is in Genesis 12, one is in 1 Samuel 14, uh, one is in Jeremiah, and the other was in Genesis with the Palestinian covenant. Every one of these covenants says this. God says, I will do this if you will do it. No, no, it says, I will do this. There is no caveat. There is no uh, a rider to the contract. Abraham, I'll make you a great people if you promise never to mess up. That is what God said. God said, I will do that. Why? Because God unconditionally promised Abraham that he would do these things, that he would do these things for David. Unconditional. That's the way God loves you. That's what's so amazing about grace, that God truly loves us. He truly loves us. I, you probably never watched I Love Lucy, probably too, too old for you. But I remember one time, I, I, I don't know her and Ricky, whatever, but, and they didn't love each other truly. They wound up getting divorced. But, but uh, uh, they went to some marriage chapel, and there was some old woman. I mean, she must have been 90 singing, I love you truly, truly dear, with all its heartache, with all its tears. Unconditional love. God loves you. God loves you, friend, this morning. God loves you unconditionally. Can you grasp that? That there is never a time that God does not love you. You say, well, you told me I was a total spiritual failure. Absolutely. Absolutely you are. You're, you're just that. But notice what it says in that Ephesians 1, 6. That we have been, that he loves us. Verse 6. We have been accepted in the blood. Why does God love us? Now, why is it that God loves me? Is it because I'm distinguishedly handsome? I think bald men are quite handsome. Is it because of that? No. Is it because I have intelligence? No. Is it because uh, we have some teachers here? No. Uh, does God love you because uh, uh, you, you try to read the Bible? No. Why is it that God loves you? God loves you because of Jesus. The only reason that, that God loves us the way he does, and God does love us, and why, the only reason that we are accepted this morning is, is because of the Lord Jesus Christ. The only reason that I am accepted in God, according to verse 6, is 
I am accepted in the beloved. Whatever it was, whatever it is that Jesus did, and we know this, that he died on the cross, paid for our sins, purchased our salvation, paid for it in full, that because of that, it's not what I have done. I often use that thing from August Top Lady who wrote Rock of Ages. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Could my tears forever know? Could my zeal no respite know? These for sin could not atone. Thou must save, and thou alone. It is Jesus that does it. The reason that I am accepted today, the reason that God looks at me and loves me unconditionally, just the way I am, is because of Jesus. And the reason that God loves you is one reason. It's because of Jesus. And he loves you unconditionally. Now, suppose, suppose I thought about this. Suppose, and I, I thought about my dad when I said this. Suppose a man doesn't ever go to church. Maybe you, or a lady. Suppose you never really went to church. Suppose you never really did go to church. And then you get saved. You do get saved. Then, boy, you uh, start coming to church, like, just like my dad. He got saved on a Tuesday night. He was in church on Sunday morning. Start going to church Sunday morning, go to Sunday school, go to Sunday night, go to Wednesday night. Uh, teach a Sunday school class. Give to the church. Take notes during the sermon. Take notes during the sermon, you know. You come and help out at the church, you work at the church, and you say, boy, God ought to love me a whole lot more now. No, he doesn't. Now, I, I, there is a difference. I want to say something quickly. There's a difference between obedience and unconditional love. Everybody ought to obey. Everybody ought to obey. But God loves us unconditionally. You say, well, this man, he comes to church, and look, preacher, he's turned over, and I don't like the term, but he's turned over a new leaf. He's different. He's changed. He's on his way to heaven. He comes to Sunday school. He comes to church. He comes to Sunday night. He, he gives money in the offering plate. He tithes. He believes God will take care of him. He comes to Wednesday night. He comes to revivals. He takes notes. He teaches Sunday school class. He reads his Bible. He prays every day. Boy, preacher, God ought to love that guy a little bit more. Money doesn't. He doesn't love him. He loves him unconditionally. Just like you, just the way you are, and you are accepted by God. You are accepted by God. Let me ask you a question. Now you think about this. I said a few minutes ago, you're a total spiritual failure. How many times, how many times do you have to tell, no, I'll back up. How many times do you have to murder somebody to be a murderer? Just once. How many times you got to steal something to be a thief? Just once. How many times you got to tell a lie to be a liar? Just once. Oh, preacher, I don't like that term. I don't like that term. I don't do that. Well, now, wait a minute. I want you to think about this for a minute. You say, preacher, God ought to love me more, and God ought to accept me more. Now, listen, there are people, I'll get back to my thought. There are people in this room who say, well, I really don't know if God accepts me the way I am. I, 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 I'll admit it to you, preacher. Preacher, I'm trying to do the best I can. And if I said this morning, everybody who's trying to do the best they can so that God would be pleased with them, everybody raise their hand. Everybody would raise their hand and say, boy, preacher, I'm trying to do the best I can. If the best I can is all that was necessary, then Jesus wouldn't have been necessary. Now, what do you think about this for a minute? You say, preacher, I'm a pretty good Christian. I'm a pretty good Christian, preacher. Preacher, I am a good Christian. I am that person you just described. I come to church Sunday morning. I come to Sunday school. I'm there Sunday night, preacher. I stay and eat food. I'm first guy in line, preacher. I'm not tell you, I'm just a great guy. Great girl, great lady, whatever. I read my Bible, preacher. I read my Bible. Preacher, I pray. I read my Bible ten hours a day. And I pray for another five. Preacher, I am just a great, great Christian. Really? 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 I want you to think about this for a minute. 
Do you always have the right thoughts in your mind? No. Come on, don't be a Pharisee. Do you absolutely always, always, always tell the truth? Never fudge. We're not talking about a white line. We're just talking about a little. I don't even know where this one came from. He fudged it a little bit. I don't even know what that means. He fudged it a little bit. You say, preacher! Well, maybe once in a while. But wait a minute. How many times you got to kill somebody to be a murderer? Just once. Look, I know that as you sit here this morning, I appreciate Deb Morley. She said one time to me, she said, I only thought that good people could come to that church. This is a church full of bad people. That are total spiritual failures. Say, preacher, I'm trying to do the best I can to be the best kind of Christian that I can, but preacher, I struggle at it. I struggle, preacher. I try to do because preacher, I'm honest. I don't always think the best thing about people. You ever get mad at somebody and, and, and uh, you know, say something you shouldn't have said? You know what? I, I, I read this. I, I've said this and I read this yesterday. You know when you're talking about somebody, remember the three questions we asked? Is it necessary to say what you're going to say? Well, I felt like I should say it. I didn't ask you that. Is it necessary? Is it necessary to hurt somebody's feelings? Is it necessary? Is it true? Well, I think it is. No. Look, even if it is true, even if it is, is it necessary to say it? Is it necessary? Is it true? And thirdly, is it kind? Now, with that criteria in mind, some of you would have to pull, stop Facebook. I, I'm, I'm serious. I mean, I, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say this. I, I know some of you get mad at me about it, but that's all right. I love you anyway. Some of you say, Preacher, I wanted to be your friend, and you wouldn't be friends with me on Facebook. Well, there's a reason why. I got all these girlfriends, and I don't want anybody else. No, no, it's not that. Is it true? Is it necessary? Is it kind? Well, preacher, I don't always follow those rules. Sometimes I say things, no, wait a minute, then you're a total spiritual failure. Well, I've never really said it, but I've thought it. I'm, I'm just going to say, did you ever get mad enough at a brother? I'm talking about a spiritual brother or a spiritual sister. Did you ever get mad at him enough that you wanted to tell him exactly what you thought about him? Oh, you're a total spiritual failure. Yeah, but I'm trying to do the best I can do, preacher. I thought you said God accepted me just the way I am. Preacher, I have tried to do the best I can, and preacher, I've gotten to the point where I just really, I'm tired. I can't do it anymore. I cannot. The struggle is so hard. I'm trying to do the best I can. I'm trying to, to, uh, I'm trying to live the right way. I want God to be pleased with me. I want him to accept me. I want to be accepted by God, but preacher, I look at my life and I've, I've failed so miserably so many times. Well, I got news for you. You're going to keep on failing. That's the na nature of the beast. You're going to keep on failing. Now, I'm not giving you that. I'm not giving you an excuse to fail. I am not giving you an excuse to fail. But you are. You think about it. You just think about it. You think about your life. I, I don't need to raise your hand. But suppose we flashed at a big screen up here and Doug or BJ or whatever, somebody flashed up here your life, and we saw it after you were saved. Oh, preacher, I tell you, preacher, I've sure tried. And I'm just not sure that God is pleased with me. I'm not sure that God likes me. Preacher, I'm not even sure God likes me. Number one, God loves you unconditionally. That's the way God loves you. You've heard me say this many times. I hate the sound of my voice. Now, the way I sound to me standing here is I sound like Darth. 
Later, James Earl Jones. I, I, you know, or I talk like Bill Clinton and say, well, I certainly don't. I hate the sound of my voice. I like, yes, James Jr. is in the bill. I, I can talk like uh, Sean Connery. I hate my voice. I hear me on the radio and I think, boy, why would anybody ever say But I was thinking about this the other day. I am the way I am because that's the way God made me. Now, look, I know that sin comes in and, has, and, 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 and brings out all my defaults. I know that. But God made me the way I am. He made me short. In my mind, I wish I was six foot six, but I'm not. In heaven, I'll be six foot six. I, I wish that uh, sometimes, not all the time, because I've pretty much gotten by having no hair. You know, I said, well, I wish uh, uh, I, I had hair sometimes. I wish I had hair, you know. That way Pete wouldn't pick on me all the time. I wish, I wish that, you know, I, I, that I could speak more clearly. I wish I could speak like David Gibbs. I mean, he is the, one of the best preachers I've ever heard. I wish I could tell stories like he does and so that people would start crying. I, I wish that I could do that. Well, this is the way God made me. And do you know that you are the way that God made you? When they, when they made me and they made you, there's nobody exactly alike like you. But preacher, I have, I, preacher, I see your point about being a total spiritual failure. No matter how hard I try, no matter how hard I try, preacher, I mess up. And I know that God cannot be pleased with me. Preacher, I, I have bad thoughts about people. I get mad at people. I yell at people driving down the road. Now, I, I don't know if you ever have. I did. And, and one of my twins jumped up the back one time and yelled at the idiot in front of me for cutting us off. Preacher, I've failed so many times, I just don't know whether God could be pleased. And you stop and look at yourself. And I look at myself sometimes, and you know, people say, well, I don't want to come over because I don't like the preacher. I don't like the preacher sometimes. And if, if you're honest, you would say to yourself, you know, preacher, I really don't like myself sometimes either. I've failed so many times, and preacher, I just have tried, and I've tried, and I've tried. And preacher, I, you're right. I can put it on a good front. I can come to church on Sunday. And I can read my Bible and I can pray. Preacher, I can act like I'm doing really, really good. Preacher, you're right. I see it. I'm a total spiritual failure. I just, and I, I don't know what to do. I, preacher, I just can't. Preacher, I don't even know how God could love me. I don't know how God could love somebody who says that they're saved, who has trusted Christ, and preacher has messed up so many times. I don't know how God could love anybody like me. And I thought that. I thought, well, how could God love anybody? I remember first day, right, right after, first day after, soon after, whatever, I was saved. It was back in 19, whatever, I... It was back in the 20th century sometime, but uh, it was back there. And, and I would remember, I remember, I remember lying in my bed at night. Nobody else was around, just lying in bed. I've asked Christ to save me, asked him to come into my heart. And, of course, the devil will come around, and the devil will do that. That's the way he does, and he comes around, and he'd start in on me. You can't really be saved. You can't really be saved. You can't really. You're right. You're right. How could God ever love anybody like me? Why would God ever love anybody like me? Now, number one, I had missed the point because I'm accepted, not because of what I have done, but I'm accepted because of what Jesus did. But I had missed that. I did not understand it. I did not grasp. I did not get that. And the devil would come around. He would come around relentless. And he was relentless. And I'm telling you, he's still relentless. He still doesn't give up. Now, I've gotten beyond that. 
But I can remember lying in my bed at night. I said, oh, God, I, I want you to save me. Lord, God, I want to be saved. I don't want to miss heaven. I want you to save me. I'm so sorry, Lord. I know I messed up again today. I'm sorry I messed up. Lord, please forgive me for messing up again. Lord, I want to be saved. Now, if you don't believe in eternal security, you know that you're, you're praying that prayer all the time. And the devil will come around, come around, come around, come around, come around, come around. And, and you know, and I'd be praying, oh, God, I'm so sorry. I'm so messed up. I'm messed up as a Christian. I'm just so messed up. Lord, I'm going to do better. But I never would. And I'd get so discouraged. How could God ever, 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 ever love anybody like me? But Ephesians 1.6 says that I'm accepted in the Beloved. Let's jump over to Galatians chapter 2. Just back a few pages. We saw this verse when we were studying Galatians. Galatians chapter 2. Now the Bible says in Ephesians 1.6 that I'm accepted in the beloved. In the book of Song of Solomon, she's, she says, she says in, in uh, chapter 5 and verse 16, she says in chapter 5 and verse 16 that is altogether lovely. She says about him. She says about him. He's altogether lovely. When God looks at you and I this morning, when he looks at us today, he, he looks down and he sees us. He sees us just like the disciples were that night when Jesus was up in the mountain praying and the disciples were out in the boat. They were in the middle of the sea toiling. They were getting nowhere. I'm sure they thought that they had reached the end of the line as far as being fishermen were concerned, the storm was quite great. The waves were quite high. Jesus saw them toiling, rowing in the midst. He was up on the mountain praying, I guess in his divinity. He could see them out there. And he comes to them walking on the sea. They thought he was a ghost. Peter said to him, Lord, if it's really you, bid me come. And Jesus said, get out of the boat. God looks down from his holy place in heaven today. And he sees you and I. He sees us just as the disciples were toiling out in the middle of the lake of, of the Sea of Galilee. He sees us working. He sees us rowing. He sees us struggling. And at times we say, I just don't know how I can possibly manage to keep going on. How could God love me? I am, preacher. You are right. I see it. I think wrong thoughts. I have wrong ideas. I watch the wrong stuff. I read the wrong stuff. I listen to the wrong stuff. I hang around with the wrong people. I laugh at their silly, profane joke. Preacher, I am a mess. How could God, how could God love me? There, there's, there's one overriding thing that you have not considered or brought in. Ephesians 1, 6 says, that I am accepted in the beloved. I am not accepted because, hey, look at that guy. He's a great spiritual Christian. Hey, look at that guy. He's a preacher. He's accepted because he's a preacher. Or look at her because she plays the piano. She's accepted. Or, or look at, hey, all the guys that showed up yesterday to help on the building, and I, I'm not shunning anybody. I'm just saying, hey, all the guys, oh boy, they must be great spiritual Christians because they showed up on their day off to help with the church. They must be great guys. That isn't why you're accepted by God. You're accepted because of what Jesus did entirely, totally, without exception. See, God doesn't look down and say, oh, that guy failed again. Oh, that woman messed up again. Ah, she claims to be a Christian, but look how, look how many, now look, I'm not giving you an out to live any way you want. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that we are total spiritual failures and until you come to that place in your life where you're willing to admit to God, yes, God, I am saved. God, I know that Jesus is my Savior. God, I know that I'm going to heaven. But God, I know that I'm a total spiritual failure. You'll never progress in your Christian life because you're all the time going to be trying and trying and trying and trying, and failing, and failing, 
and failing and failing again until the point will come where you say, what's the use of even trying? I give up. My dear friend, she was a dear friend. She's gone, she's gone to heaven. She passed, passed on. I'm sorry, she's dead. We talk about dead people here. So if you don't come to church, we talk about you because we figure you're dead too. But anyway, March Farr, my good friend, uh, lived over there on Lars Street there in Portland, just about across from where Jean lives, uh, Alliance Falls, yeah, right, right next to where BJ and whoever, Danielle, his wife, <laughs> she lived there and boy, she came to church for a while. Oh, she was... She was so on fire for God. She taught math. Now you talk about a person that had an analytical mind. Mark Farr figure out any math problem. I mean, she was just a genius at math and taught the Christian school here back in the early 80s. And, and uh, she was just, a, 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 I mean, she was a, a mathematician. To look at her, you wouldn't think that she was much of a math teacher, but she knew math. I mean, she knew it. She said to me one day, she said, Preacher, I'm trying to do what's right. Preacher, I'm trying to do what's right. I'm trying. And that's what she said. I'm trying to do what is right. But she said, the more I try to do right, the more things seem to go wrong. And I give up. Say, was she still your friend? Absolutely. I, I, I would go and see Marge two or three times a week, try to encourage her, and drink that coffee that was in her coffee pot for probably three days, but it was still pretty good. But I tried to encourage her. But she never, she never did come back. I say, what she say? Oh, yeah, I believe she say. I believe she's in heaven. Because I, I do want to say this. There is a difference. I, I'm convinced of this. There is a difference between being saved and being a Christian. You say, is, yeah, we'll have to talk about that another time. She just gave up. So what's she used to trying? The more, I, the more I try, the more I try, the more things seem to go wrong. My, I try to do right, and my kids do wrong. I'm trying to do right, and my kids are doing wrong. Preacher, nothing seems to go right, nothing seems to go right, nothing seems to go right. Preacher, I just give up. I can't do it. I can't. I love Marge. I fully intend to see her in heaven. I fully do. But the problem with Marge and the problem with so many people is they don't see themselves as total spiritual failures and until they're willing to come to a point in their life where they're willing to admit to God, God, I'm a total spiritual failure. I've tried to, tried to live a good life, tried to do what's right, tried... And I'm not saying that you should not do those things, brother. But if you do those things in, a, in, a, in an attempt to get God to love you more, what you're saying is God is beholden to me. I'm doing what I'm right, so God's got to do for me what I want him to do for me. God doesn't work like that. Now, here's the thing that I, I started to say a few minutes ago. The reason that people think that way, the reason that people think, well, how could God love me? I know I'm saved, my mom on way to heaven. I know that, but how could God love me as a total spiritual failure? There's one reason, and that is God's grace. See, if you understand what God, somebody says, well, I've sinned so many times, God can't, for, well, then you don't understand grace. If you say, well, preacher, I've sinned so many times, and I've committed the same sin so many times, then you don't understand what grace is. That's what grace is. Grace is God doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. God loving us. God showing his mercy to us. God extending that, that hand of righteousness and accepting us in the beloved. God doing that for us. You don't understand grace. If you say, well, I've sinned so many times God can't forgive me anymore. Then you don't understand what grace is all about. Galatians 2.20. You probably know this. I am crucified with Christ. You need to, and I did. I did. I came to a place in my life. 
I came to a place in my life where I said, God, this, this just didn't work. And I admitted to God, not that I needed to be saved, because I was saved. I admitted to God, God, I'm a total spiritual failure. I absolutely cannot. I want you to know the preacher is a total spiritual failure today. That's what he is. I heard Brother Curtis Hudson say this one time, and I thought it's true many times. If people knew what I was thinking while I was sitting up here, they all run for the door. Preacher is a total spiritual failure. My good brother, Pete, he's a total spiritual failure. Everybody in the room is. But when you're willing to come to a place in your life and say to God, God, I, I know I'm saved. I know that I'm on my way to heaven. God, I know my sins are forgiven. Jesus is my Savior. But God, I'm a total spiritual failure. God, I just can't do it. It's impossible. And then you come to Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. It's not me anymore. Not I. I'm a total spiritual failure, God. I can't do it. Yet not I. But Christ, which liveth in me. Many, 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 many people, Christians, say people. G. Campbell Morgan, I told you about him at the beginning, in which he sent the telegram to his dad, rejected, and his dad sent a, a telegram back, rejected a man, accepted of God. G. Campbell Morgan's daughter-in-law writes about him in her journal that he said that those days were some of the darkest days of his life. Now remember, he went on to become a, really, if I can say it like this, a spiritual giant of the 19th century. We'll see G. Campbell Morgan in heaven. He said this, those days after that rejection were some of the deepest, darkest, gloomiest days of my life. Until one day, God came to me. Now he didn't, you know, walk down the road. But God came to me and said, why don't you quit trying to do what you want to do and let me take control and you go ahead and do what I want you to do? He said that totally opened his eyes to the acceptance that he had. Listen, when you're willing to go to God and say, God, okay, I understand it. I mess up all the time, every day, mess up. I'm a spiritual failure. But God, despite that, I know that you accept me. And God, I accept your acceptance into my life. I'm not talking about being saved. I'm talking about accepting the acceptance that God has already offered and given and given to you. And then go to Galatians 2.20 and say, all right, God, man, I've tried living the Christian life and I have totally failed at it. And I have totally messed up. And God, I'm a total spiritual failure, but God, I accept the acceptance that you have of me in my life. I'm tired of trying to do it. And God, God is my witness. God, you are my witness. God, I, I want you to live your life through me. I, I've come to this conclusion. There are many, many unhappy Christians. I mean, they're unhappy. I mean, they're, they don't... I, I look at guys, I look at guys on TV sometimes, I look at, I look at some... And, and, man, some of these Christians, man, they're laughing, they're, they're jumping up and down... I know we're not charismatic, but, you know, we're there laughing. They're having a good time. I mean, and I, I say to God, God, whatever it is that they've got, that's what I want. God, I try it, 
I tried and it didn't work. God in heaven, I accept that I am accepted of you. Lord, here I am. Isaiah said, Lord, here am I. You know what, when I did that, it changed my whole outlook. I got tired of being defeated. Defeated all the time. All the time defeated. All oh, this didn't go right, that didn't go right. But now I look back and say, and I, I, honestly, I can look back and I can say, the devil comes around and starts to torment and bother. I have accepted that I've been accepted in the beloved, and not because of who I am. Brother, you don't have to struggle at it. You don't have to fight at it. Just say, okay, God, I see it. I'm accepted. I am a total spiritual failure. I failed, and I can't do it. God, I need you. I need you. Sarah asked the question about, asked the question in Sunday school, and, it, you know, it's a, it's a hard question, controversial question. So, preacher, how can we love people? How can we love everybody? How can we love everybody? Boy, preacher, you know, you, you see, um, if, if you go to the ball game, if, if you go down to the Camden Yards, you'll f see people. When we used to go down to see the ice hockey, when Baltimore had a hockey game, had a, a hockey team, we used to go down in December and January and watch the hockey. We drive back up through the middle of Baltimore, and there are people sleeping in the middle of winter on heat registers. In the house, you say, preacher, how could how could anybody ever love anybody like that? Nevertheless, the life that I now live, I live by the power of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me, Lord. I accept that I'm a failure. And I accept, though, that I am accepted by you. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I thank you again today. Lord, think of Joseph. We started with Joseph, rejected by his brethren. Lord, we think of, Lord, we really think, Lord, how many times we've been rejected by people, not accepted. Maybe because we look different, or maybe we talk different, or did things differently. People didn't like us where we worked. People didn't like us at school. People didn't like us in the community. But Lord, we've been accepted by you. And Lord, help me to accept that I am accepted by you, despite the fact that I have failed miserably. So many times that we as believers and brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord, may we accept that acceptance today. May we not struggle. But Lord, may the joy of the Lord be our strength. May we rejoice because our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Father, we thank you for that. Heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. A little different today. And we're, we're going to be done just a moment. I know we've got to practice the choir, that thing, but... Hey, Christian. You're willing to admit you're a total spiritual failure? Come on now, be honest. You know you don't always think the right way. You know you don't always act the right way. Come on. You say, well, I'm better than I was. No, I didn't ask you that. Are you willing to see that, man, I am a total spiritual failure? But that's why Jesus died. That's the good news. That's why Jesus died. And that's by God's grace and by God's grace alone that I am accepted by God. Hey, believer. Hey, my brother. Hey, sister in Christ. You say, well, I don't know how God could love me. He does. Accept the fact that you are accepted by him today. Now live your life by the power of the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. Accept it. Just say it. Lord, I accept it today. Now, Lord, again, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy to us. Thank you, Lord, for loving us the way you do. 
failures that we are. Oh, how you love us. Now, Lord, bless our meal. Bless the time of fellowship. Bless the afternoon service, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.